Almost four years ago now, I published this video on the channel, why live streaming for churches is overrated. And that is a belief that I have long held. Uh, that video wasn't the first time I shared it, but it was that video that was seen by the most people. Now, unsurprisingly, when the pandemic began and people landed on this video, comments like, this one started coming in, quote, this didn't age well, or, oh, how things change. Has your opinion changed now, LOL. This video sure doesn't apply during COVID, LOL. And then last week, I got this DM on Instagram from a pastor. Quote, you did a video on live streaming and why you'd advise smaller churches not to do it. Do you still have the same thoughts post COVID? I'm doing a church plant out of my house and really like that idea, but it seems I always get asked where my live stream is. So in this video, we're gonna revisit this question, has my opinion changed at all, or has my belief remained steadfast despite now being as unpopular as ever? Let's dive in. Okay, let's get a couple of things out of the way. My job, as I see it, is to help churches navigate the world of digital and the internet, helping you take the good news of Jesus and share it with the world, where the people are. The people are online, and so that's where we're going. But sometimes there are topics that I don't love to cover, that I'm not personally passionate about, that I do not even advocate for, yet they're so widely requested, even demanded, I make content about them. And live streaming is perhaps the best example of this, so much so that if you go to this channel's videos and sort by most popular, about a quarter of our top 25 most viewed videos are dedicated to live streaming and online church, which might lead you to believe that I'm a supporter of live streaming. In actuality, sometimes you've just gotta give the people what they want. And then to give you insight into how I arrive at beliefs like this, my primary motivation is always effectiveness. Does this drive the mission of the church forward? Does this fulfill our vision? That's how I make these evaluations. Mission's what I value most. You'll also notice the title of this video identifies smaller churches, because believe it or not, according to Barna, only about 8% of churchgoers attend a church of 1,000 or more, and almost half, 46%, attend a church of 100 or fewer, and then 40% attend a church with average attendance between 100 and 350, meaning together, 86%, Almost nine in 10 of all churchgoers in America attend churches where the average weekend attendance is fewer than 350. That's America. I'm in Canada. If you're in the UK, Australia, most places in the West, our numbers likely skew even smaller. Now, that American data, it's about five years old now from the state of church 2016. Numbers may have shifted slightly since then, but not dramatically, even with the global events we've lived through. And the reason I bring up church size at all is because Despite the vast majority of churchgoers attending smaller churches, it's the highly visible and highly influential churches that we see all the time. Think of it this way. There's a very small sliver of influential churches and pastors that make up the majority of what we see online, the majority of what we see in leadership books, the majority of who we see on stages at conferences. And when that happens, it creates conditions for a distorted perspective to emerge on what's actually happening in the everyday church. Because if we see other churches doing something over and over again, when we're tasked with making a similar decision, we're that much more likely to just follow the leader. The problem is exaggerated in digital ministry by the fact that most churches don't have people on staff or in positions of leadership with experience in digital or social or the internet, which makes us even that much more likely to copy other churches and follow the leader. And now, we're making decisions not motivated by mission or effectiveness. We're just playing copycat. And that is not a wise way to make choices. I think we can all agree on that. So how would I counsel a church smaller in size, fewer than 350 on average, let's say, on whether or not they should start live streaming? Well, there are basically three big problems with live streaming as we currently do it. And to be clear, when I use the word live streaming, I'm defining that term, how we use it in the church world, taking our in-person weekend services and rebroadcasting them on the internet. So three big problems. These problems can be reconciled, but only if they're mindfully considered. You need to really evaluate what you're doing and why you're doing it. So let's start with problem number one. Problem number one, live streaming conditions your congregation to be passive spectators, not active participants. 
Now, for some church leaders, this manifests in the fear that if they live stream their services, people will be less likely to attend in person. And that is something worth considering, I think. But the issue here that I want to articulate is much broader in scope, actually. And the place that we need to start here is asking ourselves the question, how do we measure effectiveness in our churches? I've already said my North Star for making decisions is effectiveness. How does that actually get measured? So we'll start here. In my experience, and as my degree in theology understands it, every Christ following church exists to help people love God, love others, and make disciples. These are the three objectives of every church. Now, where do these come from? Directly from Jesus, because it's from the Great Commission and the greatest commandments that our churches find much of their purpose. And yeah, sure, we may phrase it differently, right? But we all have the same target at the end of the day. Now, this existential mission is admittedly difficult to measure. So the way I've always taught to do it is through next steps. Let's revisit that mission of our churches for a moment. We exist to help people love God, love others, make disciples. Each of those objectives begins with a verb. And a verb demands action. You can't love God passively. You can't love people passively. You definitely cannot make disciples passively. Which is why everything you and I do in our churches boils down to just two words, next steps. Because without next steps, all you have is a congregation of passive spectators. And I don't know about you, but I want a church full of active participants, not spectators just taking up space. Now, if you want to learn more about next steps and what I call the new rules for church growth, I've got a full written guide on this. I'll link it in the description for more in-depth reading and exploration. But to answer that question from earlier, how do we measure effectiveness in our churches? My answer is next steps. It's our best, most accurate, most reliable tool of measurement. And what is the next step? Well, it's any action a person takes towards loving God, loving people, and making disciples. Here are a few examples of that. A commitment to follow Christ, baptism, joining and attending a small group, committing to pray for another or submitting a prayer request yourself, serving as a volunteer in ministry, attending church services and events, taking communion. These are just a few that are universal to almost every church, but each church often has a few that are unique to their own community as well. So for me, anytime I evaluate a strategic decision in church, I measure it against next steps. Will this spur on more next steps in our church? Or might it further perpetuate one of the great illnesses we have in the Western church, passivity, and conditioning folks to just be consumers of church programming and content? Now, can a church live stream propel folks toward next steps? Absolutely. But this gets back to what I said about mindfully making these evaluations and knowing how to actually measure effectiveness. Because the thing is, for most churches, the motivation to live stream is rooted in how they measure effectiveness. It's just that most churches measure their effectiveness by counting how many people attend a service. And so for those that are traveling, for those that are bedridden, for those that are locked down at home, a live stream service, it's a sensible replication of what matters most to churches. And look, I get it. Life change is difficult to quantify, which is why for decades we've used attendance as a barometer for it. But here's the thing. At its best, attendance is an ancillary tool of measurement because it's one step removed from what we're truly trying to accomplish, right? Because showing up for a service doesn't constitute life change. And it's this elevation of the attendance metric that for me is so much of the root of this issue. Because attendance is not a reliable metric for measuring effectiveness in our churches. Attendance, it only cares about external growth. Church attendance can only tell you if more people are attending your Sunday service this year compared to last year. This week compared to last week. In no way can church attendance offer any insight into internal growth at your church. Are the people already attending becoming more like Jesus? Church attendance can't measure that which is why we need a new tool for measurement. And that's where next steps comes in. And now with that new tool of measurement, we can mindfully ask ourselves, does this live stream spur on more active participation or does it spur on more passivity and treating church just like another program on Netflix to be consumed? And if we do decide to stick with live streaming, what changes can we make so that it becomes a catalyst for next steps and not an impediment? This brings us to the second problem with live streaming in its current form. Problem number two, church live streaming takes the place of more effective digital strategies. 
And this happens because the cost of live streaming is high, very often ongoing. Now, if you've watched some of my older videos that critique live streaming, one of my main points in years past has been the prohibitive cost to doing live streaming well, which is a massive hurdle for smaller churches dealing with smaller budgets much of the time. Today though, live streaming gear, it's a lot more accessible. Live streaming can be done for a reasonable cost in many cases. The thing is, very rarely is a church satisfied with their live streaming setup. There's always a better camera to buy, a more capable switcher to upgrade to, a more inventive camera angle to install. You can spend $1,000 to set up a live stream, 10,000, 100,000. I know a church sourcing a single broadcast lens right now that's in the six figure range on its own. And the thing is, once you've started live streaming and it's been established as a core ministry, it will often continue to eat portions of the budget year over year. I see it all the time because it's not common for a church to configure their live stream setup and be fully content with it for the next decade. That is unless they shell out a ton of capital when they do the setup for the first time. Basically, you got two scenarios, do a five to six figure live stream install all at once or do a lean install and then slowly add to it year over year, continuing to spend and spend. And one of the reasons this happens is because the live stream service becomes synonymous with church. Now in practice, here's what this looks like. You can approach the decision makers in your church with a Facebook ads proposal, let's say, with the intent of connecting new families to your church. All things being equal, expect that proposal to face more resistance than a proposal with an identical cost, but for live streaming because of the ubiquity of live streaming in church. But monetary cost isn't the only cost to consider either. There's also the time cost that comes from the camera operators, the person working the switcher, not to mention the pre and post production needs. And these are gonna be different for every church. And then most importantly for me anyway, there's the ministry cost. And what I mean by that is a live stream will very often satiate the digital appetite for most churches. So let's say you do a live stream on the weekends. It gets broadcast on Facebook, it gets posted to YouTube on demand after that. For many churches, that's gonna make up the majority of their presence online and on social. Now you might push back and say, well, Brady, why not just do both? Just because we're live streaming doesn't mean we're held back from doing other things as well. But the simple truth here is that resources are not unlimited. Time is not unlimited. Budget is not unlimited. And if you have a chunk of your resources tied up in a live stream, well, invariably, you won't have those resources for other digital endeavors. And if you're curious what I would recommend before a live stream that I think could be more effective at driving next steps in your church, here's one, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one. Where's DJ Khaled when you need him? Another one. Truthfully, live streaming in its current form would be near the bottom when it comes to fulfillment of church mission, effectiveness, and how well we're stewarding our finances. Those examples I just shared are just a few, but this channel is dedicated to sharing practical strategies for navigating the biggest communication shift in 500 years. And they may not always be the most popular videos on this channel with the most views, but there are more than 500 videos to explore. So make sure to subscribe, turn on notifications, go through the catalog. I've got a playlist called Start Here that's a compilation of some of the best stuff to go through first. It's linked in the description, so check that out. Let's now talk about the third and final problem. Problem number three, live streaming perpetuates the homogenization of church. That might sound complicated. Let me show you a couple real examples of what this looks like. Back to the original DM I shared in the intro from a pastor, quote, I'm doing a church plant out of my house and I always get asked where my live stream is. He's doing home church presumably in his living room or kitchen or dining room. And people are saying, where is the live stream? That mentality is the direct response to a single expression of church being the near exclusive expression of church in the West. The man can't meet in his home without people calling for an ATEM switcher that's hooked into OBS. Let's look at some more examples of this mentality. These are comments from my video on live streaming being overrated. David said, quote, if most guests are checking churches out online before coming for a service, how can something be overrated if online seems to be the new front porch experience for people? Now see, this comment assumes that live streaming and being online are the same thing. If we're not live streaming, how can we be online? To answer this question directly, create a church welcome video made specifically for guests. You make it once, you use it for a year or two, 
It's targeted directly to potential new families and people. So instead of just being a fly on the wall for some random service when they decide to check you out, you can show them what to expect for kids and in service. Share a snippet of the preaching. Here's where to park, where to go when you first get to the doors, take a next step, fill out a plan of visit form. We've got a whole video on this inspired by a church that did it. Check it out in the description. Here's another comment from John, quote, we are a church less than 300, but we're considering live streaming as a response to COVID-19 and a way of helping folks stay connected, even if they can't physically be here in worship. So look at what John is saying. He wants folks to stay connected to the church when there's physical distance, which means we've got to live stream, right? My question would be to John, are there not other ways for people to stay connected? And is watching a service from their home the ideal way for people to connect with their church family when they're physically unable? Because connecting those folks is a noble motivation for sure. Whether it's because of a global pandemic or being stationed overseas, feeling unwell, long travel for work, but what's the best way to fill that need in people's lives. You know, my co-host on our podcast, The Pro Church Tools Show, Alexander Mills, he pastors at a smaller church, and when the pandemic hit, they too wanted to connect with people when physical proximity wasn't tenable. So they picked up the phone and they called people in their church. They did on ongoing live streams, not replicating church services, but propping up mobile devices, going live from their homes directly to groups and on Facebook, taking communion together, reading scripture together, praying together, fellowshipping with one another. Because for them, that seemed effective at connecting people in their church family, more effective than simply asking them to watch worship and a message from their homes. And believe me, I am not underestimating just how disruptive what I'm suggesting is. The homogenization of church is, to me at least, a big issue. Worship, announcements, and a message, that sequence of church programming is so ubiquitous with what we know and understand church to be that doing something different, not only are you gonna face resistance, financially, it might not even be feasible. And that's because the longer something has been established and the more prevalent it is in a culture or a subculture, the more difficult it is to change it. And so I applaud the churches and pastors experimenting with different expressions of church in person. We need more of that. But the digital landscape is different because it's new and it's still in its first generation. We don't yet have a long standing history of how churches are embracing the digital world. And so we still have the power to shape it and shape how churches will use the internet to take the good news to where the people are. The time we're living through, it's so full of opportunity and potential. And yet for most of our churches, the best thing we have to offer online is taking our in-person services and broadcasting them as is. The homogenization of church, not only does it exist in person, it has now extended online. We are not innovating. We're not taking risks. We're not even mindfully thinking through our strategic decisions in most cases, but instead settling for copying what the sliver of highly influential churches are doing, the churches that are for the most part influential on account of a charismatic communicator or popular worship band, something that is not replicable in the everyday church, nor should it be aspired to. And I get it. We have a very narrow expression of church in the West. Virtually every church is the same. And like I said, it's not easy to change that. But to then apply that exact same expression as our ultimate offering online, is that much more upsetting. Why am I even making this video? I do not expect many of you to eliminate live streaming in your church. It's not the goal here. My challenge to you though, is to mindfully evaluate why you're live streaming. Is it effective? Is it propelling your congregation to more next steps? Or is it feeding the consumer culture that's already rampant in our churches? I challenge you to mindfully consider if the cost of live streaming and the resources it demands are disallowing your church from exploring the vast landscape of digital and social and all the opportunity that exists there. Because you might say something like, yeah, well, live streaming worked for us, Brady. We had a family find us online and commit their life to Jesus. And look, praise God for that. I'd ask you though, okay, live streaming worked, but compared to what? You got from destination A to B there, but what if I told you there was a faster route? You'd still get from destination A to B, but it would be faster, cost less gas. You could take more people with you. I also encourage you to explore all of the resources we've included in the description. Videos on how to enhance a live stream service to propel more next steps. Videos on alternative digital strategies that can take the place or be done in addition to a live stream. 
the all-important written guide on the new rules for church growth and recalibrating how we measure effectiveness in our churches in the first place. Really, that's what this all comes down to. And surely, there's something I've missed in this video, so feel free to add your voice in the comments below. Thanks as always for your time, attention, and trust. We'll talk soon.